Welcome to the Landscape Photography Vlogcast. Join me, Mr. Ferto Ninja, and Mr. Paul Thompson Photography from YouTube. Every Sunday morning at 10am for everything photography related. And also look out for some special guests. Grab yourself a brew, beer, or something stronger, and let's get into this week's vlogcast. Right, so welcome to the podcast. This is how many, how many is this pool now? One, uh, two, three, this is four. Number four, yeah, number four. Number four. And today we got David Johnson. Hi, mate. All right, how are you doing? I'm good. How are y'all doing? Not too bad. How is it over there in the States? You know, it's not too bad. Uh, spring's starting to fire up, but, you know, you get leaves starting to come out this time of year and mountain streams where I am are pretty nice to go and photograph, but we haven't really been able to get out and do that. Um, my kind of home park, I guess you just should say, is the Great Smoky Mountains National Park in East Tennessee, and it's been closed for weeks now. Um, and I think it's for good reason too, you know, people, that many people getting out to a park when work's closed down, you just start to treat it as a holiday and yeah. staff just can't, I mean, they can't keep up. It's not really too much the crowds and, and breaking people up, but it's more along the lines of campgrounds. What do you do about cleaning bathrooms? How do you like regenerate campsites? All this stuff comes into play. So, I mean, I understand, but that, like we were talking about earlier, it's hard to reopen things reasonably and then kind of if things get worse, shut it back down and try to figure out how do you manage that reopening time. Um, and in Tennessee, they're starting to reopen in things a little bit more and we're already starting to see some uh, just poor management of it, honestly. I predict it'll be probably closed down again in another two weeks. Yeah, yeah. 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 We, we, yeah. We've got some issues. Yeah. 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 So for anyone who doesn't know who you are, do you, I know you probably answered this question a hundred times, but do you want to just tell us a little bit about yourself and, and you, a little bit about your photography journey too, up until now? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, my name is David Johnston. Uh, I've been a landscape photographer professionally, kind of on and off the past seven years. Uh, so when I started out, I really started out doing film photography in high school. And we would just get our assignments and we'd be able to go out with our film cameras, just like a typical 35 millimeter film camera and go out and shoot we would develop our own film in the dark room and, and just have these fun like class assignments. I don't, I honestly don't think my teacher really cared what we did, uh, <laughs> which was kind of dangerous at the time. But um, as I guess, as long as we turned something in, she was happy, but it kind of fell away when I went to college and coming out of college, you know, in 2010, I got my first DSLR and I think my personality type just becomes really hooked on something that grabs my interest and I just have to learn everything about it. So yeah. I had a job where I could be out, you know, surveying land. Uh, I was a GPS and GIS coordinator in a local right. government mm -hmm. and I would go out and GPS stuff and come back and map it in the office. But while I was out, I would take my camera out or I would, you know, log locations for later that I knew would look good at sunset or sunrise and get up early before work, you know, stay out a little bit later before coming home. And that's kind of how I really honed in my skills. And then once I did go full time, uh, I did it for about three years. And my wife and I during that time moved into one of those little tiny houses. So we were oh, yeah. living in uh, 160 <laughs> square feet at the time and it was just like fun living and uh go out and shoot when you wanted to uh, and after that we uh took a little bit of a break from life in the states and uh we lived in haiti for two years we were missionaries in haiti and uh after coming back you know started the business up again and and that's kind of where we are now cool cool wow how's it what was it like in haiti uh, it, it's kind of wild, man. It's, it's, I tell people it, it's a lot like a paradox and it's kind of hard for developed countries to really understand what it's like. Um, because everything is available to us. We have, 
locations to go photograph. We have, you know, grocery stores to go to, but there you have modern conveniences on one hand with like internet and they even have uh, like fiber internet over there, which makes no sense to me because <laughs> you look at, you look at everything else they have and roads are terrible, you know, businesses and buildings are awful conditions and yeah. um you know we'd have to drive like two hours to go to the grocery store and you never knew what traffic was going to be like and it was just this weird like in between of, of worlds that we kind of lived in for two years um and, and while it's not like a dangerous place very much you know you did kind of have to be careful about where you would go for if you did want to go shoot sunset you know you didn't want to linger too long after dark yeah. whenever you're staying out somewhere but uh once you kind of gain the trust of the community around you you didn't really have to be afraid of people like doing anything to you or anything like that yeah so i suppose you've got to watch you know watch all your gear and that and is that what you mean just you know all you like I suppose obviously being in that environment is a bit, a bit daunting anyway, isn't it? When you're in that sort of foreign environment. Yeah, well. that you, you never really can predict like weather conditions there because they mm. don't have a good system to predict that. I mean, you could generally assume, you know, 4 p.m. these months of the year, it's probably going to come through and have a big storm. Yeah. But you did have to be careful about your gear, like, you know, your camera and three lenses is probably going to be like a year's salary to somebody. So it's not yeah. really a choice to them. You know, am I going to yeah. feed my family or, you know, let this white dude walking around <laughs> stay peaceful. I, I mean, that's kind of how it was and kind of how you had to think about it. <laughs> did you, did you find that your photography was um, more stripped back to more, I don't know, more real when you was out shooting in places like that or? Um, it was a little bit more raw, I think I would say, because what you're dealing with there is a landscape that's not really photographed. So you have to really think about what that location is giving to you. And it doesn't give much because there's so much clutter around. You can't go to have like a giant scenic overlook. Typically, you're gonna have farms in there too. Um, you're gonna have roads, houses, things like that. And trash was everywhere, honestly. Mm -hmm. So it was really hard to compose something that looked really nice. But I think that once you got over the problem of having to photograph what we typically think of as a nice landscape you start doing something a little bit more like documentary photography mm. where you start telling the story of the place that you're at and if trash gets in the way so be it if yeah. you know there's a dilapidated building in the way so be it or you know you could go up in the mountains where I went a couple maybe three times and photograph an amazing scene with terraced farmland going down the side of a mountain and then like low laying fog and just mountain peaks sticking out. So it, it's kind of like a give and take of where you are. And, and ultimately I think being in that situation and those conditions really taught me to work with what's given to you in the landscape and just try every time you go out to photograph something to at least, you know, create something that tells a story to your viewer yeah so you would say that obviously obviously um traveling around especially in places like that you do you do it opens your mind and you do learn and moving forward with your photography for sure i think so not only like what i was just talking about but also because you get into the situation of, of a place that's not photographed before you have no real sense of anyone else's compositions that you can kind of go out and, and play with and kind of base your images off of too. So yeah. it, the sky is the limit in that situation and it can be overwhelming uh, mm. and kind of a daunting task to see something that, you know, you're kind of like the first photographer that seriously put work into that place and you don't really want to mess it up or, you know, that thought starts to creep into the back of your mind. Like, am I doing this the right way? Um, you know, I fought 
those thoughts a lot when I was there, uh, mm -hmm. even if it was just photographing the mountains off of my back deck, um, getting out someplace like that gives you freedom, but at the same time, it's really overwhelming and ca mm -hmm. it can be challenging in certain situations. Yeah, because usually yeah. a case of where you can look look at anything and look up anywhere on the, on, on the internet and you'll find images of it somewhere. And when you go to somewhere like that and there's absolutely nothing, you don't even have a clue where you should be pointing your camera, really. Yeah, I challenge anyone to find a good landscape photograph of, of Haiti. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't exist. <laughs> That's so interesting to hear that actually, because um, I think the average, I think norm, a normal person would think, oh, that like Paul said, that would be how refreshing would that be? I am. Um, if anything, if anything, there's no rules. There's nothing, there's nothing to compare it to, so the pressure's yeah. off. But yeah, like you said, at the same time, it, it, I must, it must be quite daunting because, you, like you said, you are the first person to plonk your legs down and, and have a crack at it. So yeah, I can imagine that would be. I never thought of it like that, but yeah, it's interesting to, so talking about your photography then, how, how do you normally, I know I'm generalizing it, but how would you normally, your thought process from, from thinking, maybe thinking of a location idea to choosing a location to actually take an image and then sitting home and looking at it afterwards? How do you normally, your process normally work? Do you have like a set sort of a system that you work to? I think it evolves over time. Um, and I think it becomes more of a cyclical process, um, over a span of years. I think when a lot of people start out, you know, they go and take those just like banger shots of, you know, uh, horseshoe bend and, uh, well, what's even, the uh, well, like, um, Big vista shots, like, Mace, shots like Mesa yeah. Arch, you know, them sort of classic charts. You mean? Yeah, yeah, shots like that, places and locations like that. But over time, you start thinking about how can I make this a little bit more unique? And I think that's where a lot of people get tripped up. Um, and it did me too when mm -hmm. I started shooting more of my style of scenes because I didn't have a style at the time, you know, it's, yeah. it's really hard to break away from that and create your own style. So typically when I go and photograph a place, I'll walk into a location, especially one that I've never photographed before. You walk into that scene and you're overwhelmed like we were talking about before. And I'll take that initial shot and just frame that up afterwards. I'll kind of look at it, inspect it, uh, I know Michael Fry talks a lot about what in this image takes away from the whole composition and kind of try to eliminate that and just whittle down the composition to simplify it as much as possible. Through that process, you become aware of multiple other things going on within the landscape. So typically after taking that initial shot, whittling down a composition, it's might be like a wide angle shot, let's say. I'll set up my wide angle uh, lens on a camera on a tripod when I'm in the field and then switch over to hand holding a, a 70 to 200 or you know 100 to 400 if I'm renting a lens like that. Typically I don't have one with yeah. me, but I'll try to pick little things throughout the landscape that are interesting or that are unique to that place, maybe even a macro shot here and there, but I'll kind of wait for the light to get right with my wide angle lens. And that way I kind of have a multitude of different kinds of shots from the same location. I kind of maximize my time there that way because when we go into locations, what people typically don't think about is, you know, we're there five, six days at a time. And if we want a certain shot or a certain location, we may go back to the same place over and over and over, you know, night after night. Because yeah. That can be said for like night photography too. If you want that certain Milky Way shot, you know, you have a small window of nights that you can go out there and get that shot. So it really becomes a technique of, trying to maximize your time and your photos in a location, but also trying to whittle down the composition to making it 
make just enough sense to where you can see what the subject is, but having enough complementary subjects within that image that points to that subject without taking away from it. And it's a really delicate balance, I think, that, I mean, I still have trouble dancing around with in the field or, or kind of like even teaching people how to do because it's a feel thing yeah. you know, whenever you are in, out in the field. Definitely. I can definitely relate to that because that's uh, decluttering and trying to simplify, like you just said, is something that I've tried to work on and tried to grow into. And um, since starting workshops, that's the thing that I found hard to try and relate to people that I take out is trying to, how do I make this come across? Um, how do I, how do I take what I'm thinking in here and, and sort of transport it into the person I'm taking? And I think that's quite a, definitely a challenging thing to do. But uh, yeah. So how, so how do you, how do you feel like you've, is there anything, one particular thing you think you've grown it into? Like it's something you've thought five years ago, I must be better at that. Or how has your journey been, do you think, to the point where you are now? How do you Man, think I think five years ago, really, it was more along the lines of how do I take a great photograph every single time I go out into the field? Mm -hmm. um, but I quickly learned that that leads to a lot of frustration <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, and trying to yeah. do that every single time. And man, I just, I would beat myself up so much uh, if I came back empty handed or even tried to force a photo like into the realm of like website worthy images. Um, and I think if I've gotten better at anything, it's being okay with coming back empty handed yeah. And when I do have something, you know, in my camera that I can really look at and be proud of and, and enjoy and, you know, great conditions apply to that too. Uh, the editing part of it, being patient in editing has been a huge learning curve for me just because, you know, everything that we're taught, if you do go into like a uh, typical job scenario is speed and just maximizing time and really just trying to churn out things as fast as possible. And when you do that, you know, you can look back at the images that you posted two years ago or five years ago and say, well, kind of missed that dust spot there or wish I would have added a little bit more contrast with dodging and burning here or there. So yeah. really taking the time to, look at an image for a longer period of time and then come yeah. back to it a month, two months later and, and try to clean it up as best possible and deconnect, like getting that deconnection from your images is important, still loving them, but also having that deconnect from emotion from them to really objectively look at them has been probably the biggest thing that I've tried to improve on. Um, with my own photography, like you said, over the past five years. Yeah. So, so do you find then with doing YouTube videos, do you find an added pressure with getting an image or do you not let that bother you at all? I think, you know, it's kind of the same answer, Paul. It's kind of like when you started out, yeah, I put a ton of pressure on myself to get an image every single time. Yeah. And, and YouTube, you know, what's so interesting about it is that thought gets into the back of your head. Like this is not an Instagram post. Mm -hmm. YouTube is a search engine that can stay evergreen for yeah. five, 10 years. So when you do come back empty handed, you're kind of like, well, what was the point of somebody watching that 10 minute long video? I mean, they yeah. just totally wasted their time doing that. But I think going out into the field and, and trying to photograph something and teaching people along the way or communicating effectively like why something doesn't come together and give yeah. them tips as well on this may be something that you can come back to at this condition or this type of year or tell talk to them or teach them about you know how to log this into photo pills is you know a really good way to use that platform but 100 percent now like I think I did one last year that somebody, it was right around the, the same time as this year and somebody commented on it yesterday. <laughs> and I had totally forgotten, like I even went on this trip out there, but yeah. I went to a, a totally new 
uh, national forest that's just south of where I live. And I went out there, I hadn't really found a lot of images on it to really, you know, see what's out there. So I just went out there to hike and, and try to find something. And at the end of the video, I remember saying, uh, I totally hated today. Like I'd got nothing. <laughs> the light was terrible. Conditions were awful. Uh, but it was still fun to shoot. And, and somebody commented on it yesterday and I was like, oh man, I totally like missed an opportunity to at least teach them something about or share some advice about not coming back with something every single time. But yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting to hear you say that actually, because that's, I found that with a, a fairly recent video as well. I was, I was toying with the idea of completely sacking it off and just been in it because I'd got myself so obsessed with the fact that the image wasn't, wasn't right. I thought, what's, what's the point of this? And then I kind of thought to myself afterwards, now the whole point is to get across that it doesn't always work out. It, it never always works out as you think it's going to. And it's good to get that up across to the people as well. Yeah. Well, what, I mean, like this type of year, spring, y'all are in Northern hemisphere too. So like, is it, do y'all find the same thing? Is it, is it hard to kind of compose something and, and plan on blooming trees and, and great lighting conditions right now? It's difficult, isn't it? It's, it's more yeah. difficult. Well, I don't um, know. Cause I, I'm not a huge planner anyway. That's more. Tom's realm I don't do it I don't do it. I like I've got more of a kind of open feel to my photography I like to t kind of turn up somewhere and and really take it as it comes unless I'm going specifically for a certain purpose which you know I don't do that often yeah I think since um because I, I I've been I started my photography like growing up um by the by the sea so uh the seasons are not so um they're not so distinguished. We don't have so, so distinguishable uh, seasons. We don't have sort of like, obviously we have spring, autumn and winter, but we tend to, we, we tend when, to, when do we have those? Let me know. Yeah. <laughs> 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 we, just, we just tend to have um, summer and winter and it's windy and windier. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was thinking. Yeah. Up down by the sea. So it's uh, since moving back to, um, still southern but slightly higher i got some real good woodlands and things like that and i'm starting to this year i was starting to think right now i need to be doing this more spring autumn the bluebells um and things like that so yeah it's something that i was planning on doing this year was practicing taking advantage of them seasons but obviously with the way things have been going uh yeah none of that's none of that's come to come to light but but yeah it's uh Planning, planning is a, a funny thing, isn't it? You know, you can, it's a bit like we were talking about earlier about um, trying to learn to be okay with not getting a shot. I find planning very similar. You have to, yeah, you obviously make a plan. You choose a location based on the weather or, or season, uh, but, but you have to be okay with it might not work out because that will obviously relate to not getting an image as well. Yeah. You know what I mean? Do you, do you find the seasons are very distinguishable over, over, over your way or? Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. And you know, where I live typically, I live in West Tennessee. Um, so we are still technically like the South and the Southeastern States. And in the winter, you know, it's typically 50 degrees and rainy uh, for the majority of winter. Uh, which is really depressing and, and sad. <laughs> we might get like one or two days where it snows and everybody freaks out, but it's yeah. only, you know, a half an inch of snow or a dusting of snow on the ground that is just nothing. And um, then spring, you know, you get really nice weather, typically weather you would find kind of like in San Diego almost of 70s, you know, sunny, it's really nice. You get a lot of trees that start to leaf out and it's just this bright, vibrant green and it just looks incredible. Um, and then summer is just really like the deepest pits of hell and heat. <laughs> and it's just this, this like just terrible humidity. I mean, it seems like 
like that the temperature goes up 20 degrees because it's 95% humid outside yeah. and it's 95 degrees in and of itself. So it's just this oppressing heat and trying to go out and photograph and that is just abysmal unless you are by a Creek or something and you can wade in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and then fall is, it's really, fall is the most difficult to predict. Okay. So you go out, uh, you can go out the same week of every single year and fall is going to look completely different throughout because two years ago we had an amazing fall uh, leaves turned for two weeks at a time and they were peak for a really long period of time. And you had ample amount of time to go out and photograph. However, when you got like conditions like we had last year, what tended to happen was we got a really bad, drought around the time that fall started so leaves started to burn off a little bit more um, yeah. and you didn't get a lot of those leaves hanging around in the trees and peak color lasted for just a few days so you had to bust it when you went out and try to get as much image as you could out of that short time period so it, it's really predictable three months out of the year I would say and then falls kind of like that wild card that you have to yeah. play around with so let's let's talk a little bit about light and composition how and obviously everyone seems to sort of focus on composition and then some people focus on like framing around some light um how how do you normally what's your priorities in terms of um in terms of that uh i think i go more towards the composition front um rather than just focusing on light but i mean that can get you in a little bit of a mess a lot of times can it it's just yeah yeah you know you, you once you get stuck to a composition you end up kind of with tunnel vision of just seeing that one type of shot uh and it kind of goes back to what i was talking about using two cameras at one time because you can kind of set up a composition that you want and hope for that light to come in. Yeah. And then you also have another camera that you can play with to react to the light. And I think, yeah. I think a lot of times it, that's the most healthy way to photograph and healthy way to stay balanced. Because while, you know, we were talking about a little bit ago, you know, Paul was talking about not being a planner and, kind of going out and just seeing what happens when you do go out. And I think, I think planning is important, but I think I also think there's a balance to it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Really definitely. honing in on a shot that you want, but then as, as well, being able to react and adapt to everything going on in the landscape typically has its advantages too. So there's, there's two different ways of looking at it and, and both have pros and cons and I think it just comes down to what that typical photographer likes to do. I know I, one of the types of photography that I'm just terrible at is like the small scenes that a lot of photographers gravitate to once they are tired of wide angle shots. Mm -hmm. um, and I know photographers like uh, Alex Noriega, Sarah Marino, they kind of preach the just go out and wander and, and see what happens. So I, I can't really do that. My mind doesn't work that way. Um, I kind of have to have a goal in place of what I could potentially get. And then if I don't find that, just play with what's there and then just try to create something while I'm out there. Yeah, I think that comes for me, especially well, Tom, you'll be the same is with having kids, it's finding that time to get out and, and do it. So it's a case of when we do get out, it's, well, you can't just say, well, I haven't got the conditions I want. Uh, I wanted at the time. You've got to kind of adapt for the conditions that are there. So at least you can come back with something. That's the idea for me anyway. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, have, I definitely have limited time. Um, but that is kind of why I like him. I like to plan or have some sort of plan in my head which never follows through, but it just seems to help me organize how I'm going to go about it. But yeah, it's, um, time is, time is a, a major factor for me. Um, especially like we said, when we pull off, it's not full time. So, um, yes. when you do, yes. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If, if Lumix are listening, I am available. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> is it tough though? I mean, both of y'all have kids. I'm going to have our first uh, kid is coming in August. So like I, I kind of see that on the horizon and I'm thinking, you know, <laughs> what little time I do have, even though I am full time, you know, typically when you do go full time, photography is still your second job because you're doing the business side of it for so much time out yeah. of the day. And, you know, what, how do you guys advice for me on, on balancing time? <laughs> wow, um, oh, do you cry? Where do we start? <laughs> congratulations for a start. Yeah, congratulations. Thank you. Definitely. Uh, it, Enjoy it while know, it lasts. That's all I'll know, say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you know if you're having a boy or a girl? We're having a girl. Yeah. Oh, I do. I do. I can, I can, well, that's the same as me. I've got a little girl. She's two now. So, um, advice. Um, if you think you're tired now, you ain't. Um, <laughs> that's probably the best advice yeah. I've gotten so far. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I take it cause obviously you're a photographer. You're used to getting up early and you're used to, right. I don't know, not running on less than eight hours, but you're used to, I, like me, I can, I can fall asleep pretty much anywhere if I need yeah. to. Yeah. Um, which has helped me, but yeah, um, le you'll, you'll learn to sleep whenever you can, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, for sure. They don't have uh, off buttons. There's, there's, no. There's, no, <laughs> there's, there's just no off button on them. Are you all. quite laid back? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's good. Cause you're going to have, you learn to just let things slide. You know what I mean? Like a few times I've had a uh, willow on my own. Um, which is quite rare, mainly at weekends. And, uh, you know, she gets her toys out and then she plays it for like 30 seconds and then she's like, Daddy, do this. And I'm like, <laughs> hang on a minute, whoa. I said, let's put these away first. And then, <laughs> uh, and I used to do it all the time. Now I just let the house get in a complete mess. And then I quickly tidy up before Kirsty comes home. <laughs> <laughs> Oh uh, yeah, so that's about all I can say. Really, it's just go with the flow and just grab any sleep you can. That's good. I like that. Yeah. yeah. What are you, Paul? Yeah, I would say the same. You have got boys, haven't you? Yeah, I've got two boys. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it sounds like you have a lot less trouble than I do because <laughs> <laughs> it's just utter chaos. <laughs> Every day is just utter chaos. I come I come home from work, and after a day's work, you're thinking, yeah get home and get a bit of a relaxing time now yeah as soon as you walk through the back gate it's screaming there's kids running from one end of the garden to the other <laughs> oh it's just utter bedlam having two of them and i think it, having two it's even worse because they bounce off each other so it's just, yeah yeah <clears throat> but now nah, you, yeah. you'll love it mate you'll love it it's um no matter how tired you get or frustrated you get or i don't know hungry you get it's um when when she when she says daddy and you sit on your lap and you read her a book and and nice it's, yeah it's brilliant I I love I can't wait to get home from work um, even if I think oh she's gonna be a nightmare <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah it's it's good fun it's all good fun yeah, yeah I told my wife I wanted a girl when we first found out just like from facts that you know I had a brother <laughs> an older brother growing up. And we, it was like Paul said, it was just chaos every single day. We would just try to like fight and break each other's arms and <laughs> all, I mean, it was just madness at our house, but that's kind of why, why I wanted a girl. It just feels pretty more chill. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah definitely. Yeah. It just... is, yeah. It's funny. It seems like yesterday she was still on her hands and knees and then the next minute she's like telling me what to do and... <laughs> It's, uh, and, you know, he said, I don't know, I, I'm quickly feeling outnumbered. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So talking about your, you going full time and your business side of things, how, how do you see your business going forward into, into the future? Uh, I think it's starting to transform a little bit, especially with everything going on right now. Um, you know, I think it was about two, two and a half years ago, maybe even I was on Matt Payne's podcast and I told him, you know, I fully anticipate that in the near future workshops will die. Um, and that was kind of like this, whoa moment, I think at the time, but 
I think it's starting to come to fruition a little bit. You know, I think workshops can typically be, depending on the location, a little bit saturated. But at the same time, what we're seeing now is with everything starting to move online, I think people are getting a little bit more creative about how they make money online with their photography. And that's going to start pushing that type of work forward a little bit more. And also the quality. If you look at courses that you can buy online right now, typically across the board, you can probably, if you're savvy with, with video editing and audio, you can churn out a whole course in a day if you really bust it that entire day. Yeah. But over time, what we're starting to see, especially with guys like uh, Michael Shane Bloom coming out with a time-lapse course, uh, Ian Plant starting to make some of his courses on landscape photography, they're taking whole production teams out with them. So yeah. it, it's really starting like we talked about in the landscape, reacting and adapting. I think looking at photography business and I, I, a lot of photographers don't like the business side, but that's the part about it for some reason that I get really like excited about. And I love the business side. It's more of a, a game to me. I'm a highly competitive <laughs> person. Um, so the landscape side is the relaxing side of my life and 50% of that. And then the business side is when I, you know, make a to-do list and really bust it out of what I need to get done. And I think production wise, it's going to start to get a little bit more in depth, how good that video quality can be. People are going to start noticing, you know, when you mess up a word here and there, they're going to start noticing video quality, audio quality, sound effects in the background, how much editing work you put into it. Um, and, and with that same thing, while video, online video continues to be kind of what everybody gravitates to right now, we're starting to see more saturation in that market too. So how do you react to that? You know, do you up your game? Are you using this time right now that we're living in as a way to learn more video editing techniques, maybe play around with Premiere Pro, After Effects, really getting some graphics into your work. I think that is where you get set apart from everybody else. Um, communication is obviously very important. Um, production is obviously very important. Information, very important. What you give them in the course, very important. But people want to be entertained through that as well. And I yeah. think putting little things in there uh, really help you stand out in that sense. And I think that is where I'm putting more of my eggs into that situation, that basket, um, or the leg of the <laughs> stool, if you want to look at it that way, you know, how many sources of income do you have? The more we do this, the more online work is going to push workshops out. And that's not to say, that you still can't have workshops as a part of your business model. Of course you can. It's yeah. just, yeah. you have to really work with specific locations. I think the ones that get the most signups, um, you really have to think about how are you doing this legally? Um, because so many places, <laughs> especially in the States, you know, national parks have a lot of stipulations you have to get through. You have to get licensing, you have to get, uh, certifications here and there. So you really have to think about how you're going to do this legally and get those certain qualifications you have to get. And all that comes into money too. You know, how do you budget yeah. all of these costs? And it's just all of this starts to snowball into just so much work that I think a lot of people don't see when they say, you know, I want to become a full-time landscape photographer uh, then when you start talking about these things, they get overwhelmed. Um, but yeah, that's, that's so where I see, that's where I see it going. Yeah. 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 That's, uh, it's interesting you say that actually, because uh, me and Paul have talked about it, especially recently with this whole, um, virus thing, you know, um, yeah. it's, it is, like you said, it is forcing people, forcing people's hand a little bit. Um, yeah. it is interesting to see. You know, everyone's doing a lot more people doing podcasts, um, a lot more people 
doing online courses. Um, yeah, so it will be very interesting to see how how it all goes. But like you are right, I do think that that is. I think people, there's always going to be a market for workshops, but I do think it will be more like you said, like a smaller market. You'll you'll have to spread it out a little bit more into your time into other things, uh, definitely. Yeah, I think too, Tom. Like <clears throat> pointing that out is, I think once you do start whittling down your workshops you have to get more comfortable to being a presence online uh, you have to get a little bit more comfortable with the fact that in essence we are influencers i mean typically when you think of an influencer on instagram you think of a millennial female who's pushing beauty products on yeah. you know what you should buy or like stuff that you cook with or, you know, just those household items really. Mm -hmm. And that can be male or female now that we're starting to see. And, and what is happening with that is photographers in general kind of have this mindset of, I don't want to be that. So I'm going to push that away. And instead, I think we need to look at what they're doing well and bring that into landscape photography. How are they communicating with their audience to get people to respond to what they're saying? Not in sales, but in <clears throat> that can be time spent, that can be email inbox, that can be attention, comment, shares. You know, you can't always think about that person as a customer. Uh, you think about them as a fan, as a friend. Um, so what are they doing well? that's going to adapt to what I'm doing in photography and how do I communicate that? Maybe just changing a few words around and not trying to reinvent the wheel per se, but instead using what they're doing that's working and implementing it to what you're doing that's working. Does that make sense? Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I, like you said, it's all about um, adapting to the demand really. And, you know, and the way things are, uh, you know, you, you, I think the people that, um, the people that I, I don't know, are stubborn to that or, um, or miss the trick are going to, might struggle in, in, in the near future. I don't know. I, th I think it will be nearer than people think, especially yeah. as you know, these days, you know, you, you got to talk to, uh, I don't know how, how many kids you talk to and you ask them what they want to do for a living. Um, <laughs> in a landscape aside, you know, I'll bet you a lot of them would say, you know, I'll, I want to play Call of Duty for a living, or yeah, <laughs> you know, you know what I mean. I know, it's, I know it's not the same genre, but you can relate to where things are going to be going. Yeah, you definitely yeah. have to adapt with it. That's for sure. You definitely have to go with it, and as you say, see what works and bring it on board. Really, you can't really close your eyes to anything. I don't think. No. Otherwise, yeah. you will get left behind. I think. Right. Um, shall we end with a quick fire? Yep. Um, these are questions that we we're trying to do to everyone and ask everyone, aren't we? So let's start with the first one. I'm going to try not to mess this one up. <laughs> I've done it the last time. <laughs> you wrote them. That's the best part. Yeah, I think maybe you should do it next time, for, actually, because obviously I ain't no good at it. <laughs> right. Um, black and white or color? Color, for sure. Uh, mirrorless or DSLR? Mirrorless, saving money on space and weight is just essential in my opinion. I like, I like how he's, he's expanded on his answers. Yeah, I know yeah. it's a quick fire. Yeah, it's nice to give him more information. <laughs> <laughs> uh, landscape or portrait? Ooh. Wow, that's tough. Okay, yeah. portrait is what... Look, at, I'm starting to talk like you now. Portrait no, <laughs> is what I gravitate to. Landscape is what I typically try to force myself to shoot. Right. Oh, uh, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, I'm, I'm normally the other way around. But yeah, that's cool. Light or composition? Composition. Filters or ex exposure blending? Ooh, exposure blending just because I hate the clutter of things. I'm a minimalist. So the less gear I can use to screw something up, the better. <laughs> <laughs> a Photoshop or Lightroom? Uh, typically Lightroom or I'll give you a, a different one. I use Luminar a lot oh, actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And I like the, the 
images that it turns out to. Sunrise or sunset? Sunrise for pastel colors. Now, do you prefer to shoot local or the rest of the world given a choice? It's changed. So I used to go rest of the world. Now I'm going more local. Um, plan or spontaneous? Plan. Woodland or landscape? Landscape. I suck at woodland photography. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. That is still <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um Intimate or grand vista? Grand vista, but forcing myself into more intimate. <laughs> that's that's um intimate something that i'm been trying to do as well a bit more uh if you ever heard if you ever heard of a chap called simon booth yeah yeah um me and simon are quite quite pally and in i just love the way that he even if he's not using a macro lens um like he, he does tend to pick it's amazing what he picks out i see um an image he took i don't know a few months ago and it was just uh like some pine cones I don't know how you've seen it, but uh, the way he, the way he composed just a pile of pine cones was just insane. So yeah, find, trying to find them intimate intimate little scenes is certainly a challenge, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. It certainly is. How are you finding the new Sony? Uh, I like it, man. Uh, it's it's different. It's um, it definitely slows down my computer a little bit more yeah, with yeah. the file size, but. I do like it. I, I think it's helpful that the menus are kind of similar. Yeah. Um, so I already know basically where everything is, but in one of the 300 menus. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, man, I still will gravitate back to that a 6,000 so many times it does turn out some really good images. Yeah, um, it does. That's what I, I had. really enjoyed it. So that's what you have too. Well, I had I had one. That's what, I got one for vlogging. I got an A six thousand for vlogging with, and I, I I quickly found myself using it more than my main camera at the time, and that's the point where I started using the A six thousand, and then from there I I got the A seven R two, and uh, yeah, I just love it. Just love it. I got used to using that A six thousand, and I just decided I wanted to stick with Sony really. Yeah, I was using the A6000 for vlogging too, and um, I really liked it. The only bad part about it is it doesn't have a flip screen so that you can't see yeah. how you're composing the video. So yeah. I got a Fuji X-A7 and was trying it out and just hated it. Like the yeah. menu, uh, I, I love like the X-T3, X-T30, but the XA7, like the menu was so confusing and it made no sense. And the, the autofocus on it wasn't great. Um, so I actually went back to the A6000 a little bit more, but then also used the uh, D little DJI pocket camera, yeah. the Osmo pocket. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's yeah that thing is pretty I'm, sweet. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Just to have it in your pocket and just you can just pull it out and away you go. It's ready to go. Yeah, for sure. No, no messing about. Yeah. Go, GoPro killer, eh? Yeah. <laughs> it is. It yeah. Be, yeah, I think it is, to be honest with you. It's less, yeah. clut it's less cluttered and you can just, as I say, you just pull it out and you go. There's no messing around with it. You can, you can flip it around so you can see the little tiny screen this big. Mm -hmm. at, least yeah. can, <laughs> at least you can kind of compose something with it and get yourself in frame. That's a good thing. So do you want to tell us a little bit about where people can find you, David? Sure. We yeah. People can find me uh, on my website at davidjohnstonart.com uh, on YouTube. If you look for David Johnston photography and um, you know, Instagram, Twitter, uh, putting actually a pretty good amount of work in on LinkedIn and TikTok right now. Uh, no dancing or anything like that on TikTok. <laughs> uh, I don't have the moves. <laughs> Paul, I mean, you could do well on there. Look at you go, man. That's awesome. Um, that's pretty good dad dancing, that man. Yeah, it was. Yeah, wasn't it? Good. I'm, get, I'm getting down at dad dancing. That's something you'll learn. That's something you'll learn, mate. You'll get good at that. Yeah, absolutely. And you can on all those platforms. It's just David Johnston photo. Um, but you know, watch for watch for TikTok. I think is another place for photographers to gravitate to. I'm seeing a lot of um, bad 
advice for photographers on TikTok. So if you get yeah, yeah. better advice on there, I think it's a good place for growth right now. Yeah, I just oh, I downloaded it. I just downloaded it for that very reason because I saw you saying about it that it was uh, it was an up and coming place. So I thought, oh, yeah. I better check that out. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna have to look at that as well. I didn't know anything about that. Oh, yeah, I check that out. I just before we go, um, you just to talk a little bit about nature for nature first because you're yeah, yeah, yeah. Cause they've recently approached us and we're starting. We've started up a page and and. We just like we just loved them what their principles were and what they were trying to do. So we, we me and Paul grabbed the opportunity to do that. And I know, we noticed obviously that you you were a part of the uh, organization as well. Do you how do you uh, how did that come about? Yeah, I think um, knowing Matt Payne had a lot to do with it. Yeah, uh, right. he reached out to me and and kind of asked about it and what I thought about their principles and if I wanted to join and and be a member. Uh, I think one at the time of their launch, uh, I was one of the first members. So um, it's important to not only photograph a place, but also fall in love with it. And doing so responsibly is a great way to learn more about a location. And I think once you really start to know more about locations and the more how to appreciate them responsibly, the better images you can get. And also you become kind of like an advocate for that place. So yeah. like I've talked about Great Smoky Mountains National Park, a lot of times what I see is those like stacked rocks by the river. Um, I don't know yeah. what, I don't know why people do that, but in the Smokies, there is an endangered salamander that will actually lay its legs up under stones in those locations. Uh, and when people take the stones out and start stacking them, it kills the eggs. So knowing little things like that and knowing, you know, not to remove anything from the landscape or alter it in any way and, and put nature first over your images is a really good way to better understand and better appreciate the places that you are going to shoot. And not only that, talking so much about what we're going through right now, how we can't go out to national parks currently, yeah. but this is a great time. If we think about it positively, this is a tremendous time for locations to regenerate from all the terrible things that we've done to it. Again, look at Great Smoky Mountains National Park. We had a huge fire a few years ago on one of the most popular sections of the park that completely torched the landscape and it hasn't had time to regenerate well enough to handle that much foot traffic. And I think this being spring and having so much growth come into play with no foot traffic yeah. has been a tremendous time for that section of a park to regenerate and get more growth in. And, and once we do go back, I would highly encourage everybody to join nature first, to look at its principles, to apply them to your photography and above all else, don't damage the landscape. I see it so many times when I go out to shoot of people just doing dumb stuff for the sake of a photo and, mm -hmm. and just fight that temptation when you're out. Cause yeah, if you do snap that tree limb to get a better view of, of the valley <laughs> that you're photographing, it'll probably be a better photo, but you are, kind of doing your part in damaging landscapes and then yeah. doing your part for the snowball effect of what humans can cause to a location. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Cause we have the same problems here. Certainly. I mean, there's places in Scotland that have just been trashed quite honestly by to so much footfall. And, um, that's one of the reasons why I took it on as well. Cause I, I thought it was a great idea and we needed something over here in the UK to, uh, kind of carry that message forward really so that's why yeah. we both joined up just to kind of give people somewhere to go for for that information I, i'm just i'm sick of rubbish um yeah, yeah. Like litter um living like living by the sea um i used to obviously go out and shoot lots of seascapes um and just the beach when when we especially when we had when we had just like a big high tide yeah uh the rubbish and then since moving to wiltshire uh, to wiltshire the countryside and the woodlands i know it's, it's a more densely populated area anyway um but 
the litter you see even when you walk like two miles into the into the, the old oak forest you still find litter so yes um it was a no-brainer for me if i'm honest yeah so yeah it's been a it's been a blast talking to you mate i really I really look forward to all week to talking to you and um i wish we could talk for longer but we <laughs> this podcast is going to be about three hours long. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so anytime y'all want to have me back on, just let me know. It yeah, we last. will, definitely. Yeah, no worries. So what, we'll do, what we'll do is as well, as I'll put all the links in the uh, description of the video below, as well as yours and Nature First. So if anybody wants to check that out, please get on board. Yeah, ideal. And awesome. if you're ever in the UK, you know where to check us out and uh, we'll see if we can sort out some sort of uh, a meetup or something, mate. Will do. Thank you all. Cheers, mate.